Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is the first of a two-part conversation on From Shirtwaist to Wisconsin, Labor Unions and the American Worker. On March 25th, 1911, 146 workers, mostly young Italian and Jewish women, some as young as 14, died in the greatest industrial tragedy in New York City history. A public outcry pushed the New York State Legislature to enact the strongest worker protection laws in the nation. And inspired by New York, reformers across the country successfully pushed many other states to adopt stronger labor laws. On March 4th, 2011, Wisconsin Governor Scott Walker signed a bill gutting collective bargaining for public workers, eliminated state collection of union dues, and required annual union certification. The reaction has been tumultuous, a burst of pro-worker action. The fire last time, the fire, or just ashes this time. Here to talk about workers, labor unions, and the American way, then, now, and to be, are Joshua Freeman, Ed Ott, and Arthur Cheliotis. Joshua Freeman is professor of history at Queens College. He is the author of the award-winning social and labor history, Working Class New York, Life and Labor Since World War II. He has also written In Transit, The Transport Workers Union in New York City, 1933 to 1966, and co-authored Who Built America? He is the dean of New York labor historians, and he's a frequent commentator on organized labor and union politics. Ed Ott is a distinguished lecturer at the Murphy Institute of the School of Professional Studies at CUNY. He is the former executive director of the New York City Central Labor Council. Ed has been active in the labor movement for over 40 years. And finally, Arthur Cheliotis is president of Local 1180 of the Communication Workers of America of the AFL-CIO and has been president since 1979. That local represents middle, middle and high-level administrative and supervisory employees in New York City mayoral agencies, the Health and Hospital Corporation, and the New York State Court System. Author is the senior member of the New York City Municipal Labor Committee and a member of the executive board of the New York City Central Labor Council. These are our guests. Welcome, gentlemen. Welcome back, Joshua. Welcome, mm -hmm. Arthur. Welcome, nice Ed. Nice to be here. Okay. Let's start with the tri Triangle Shirtwaist Fire. 100 years ago, last week, 146 th uh, women died. Some of them by fire, some of them by smoke, and some of them jumping out of the building. What happened briefly, and what did it lead to? Right. Well, Triangle Shirtwaist Fire is a big garment factory. It's right off of Washington Square Park. The building's still there. It's now an NYU building. This was actually considered a modern garment factory. Uh, it had been a place which had been struck two years earlier, part of a big uh, effort by garment workers to uh, unionize. The owners had been the leaders of the opposition to the union in the industry, successfully kept the union out. And on a Saturday afternoon at the end of the workday, uh, as people were leaving the building, a fire broke out uh, in a big pile of scrap, uh, had tissue paper, you know, uh, cloth, and um, it spread very quickly. The factory was on the 8th, 9th, and 10th floor of the building. People on the 8th and 10th floor largely escaped, but those on the 9th floor were trapped by the flames, by a locked exit door, by a fire escape which collapsed. Uh, the fire department uh, arrived pretty promptly, but they only had ladders that could reach the 6th floor. So, uh, in effect, they were caught in this flaming uh, uh, inferno, and many of them, rather than burn to death, left to their death. Okay. And this fire created what in the crucible of, you know, New York politics and then national politics? Well, there was a tremendous outpouring of grief uh, in the New York working class. You know, 350,000 people uh, took part in a funeral procession. Uh, and, and, and a sense of outrage. And I think this pushed forward what was already growing, the notion that the conditions of working people at work 
were a public matter. These were things that could not simply let, you know, be left to the unilateral control of the employer. And they did what? Well, uh, the Tammany Hall looked around and suddenly realized that they were going to be in big trouble if they didn't address this issue. They were being pressed by the union, pressed by the socialists, pressed by upper class reformers. They set up a factory investigating commission headed by Robert Wagner and Al Smith. They did detail. Giants in New York State politics. Then One young and up and governor. then right. young up and comers. And not Tammany. Yet, exactly. Right. Uh, not yet giants, but they really helped create a new political configuration that brought together reformers, unionists, and the kind of liberal wing of the Democratic Party, and they began to say the state has to regulate the workplace. And they did. They regulated hours, sprinkler systems, mm -hmm. all kinds of sure. reforms. Now, a hundred years later, mm -hmm. you've got Scott Walker right. signing this piece of legislation in Wisconsin. Where have where has labor gone, or how have how has labor come to this point in 2011? Ed and then Arthur. Well, you know, we could accelerate through history, but uh, let's just go through the last 30 years or so. Go ahead. We have since last basically the last 30 years gone through this extended period of a reduction of workers' rights to organize, a suppression of wages, the wholesale exporting of industries, which was the heart of the industrial unions of this country. That process, that wage suppression, where you drive private sector wages down to where people are making $10 an hour or less, no sick days, no vacations, no pensions, results in the isolation of the public sector. This is not about money. This is about power. Scott Walker, who, who said this openly last November, that he was going to go after collective bargaining, front page of the Wall Street Journal, he is quoted, that moment is about we are going to remove another obstacle of organized workers so we can continue to shift wealth towards the top. I mean, he, he didn't say this explicitly. He said it explicitly in the Wall Street Journal that, and here's the quote, now we can have a real discussion. This is right after the 2008 elections. Now we can have a real discussion on whether or we should have collective bargaining in the public sector at all or not. Okay, so Arthur. Part of this has been sold by governors, mainly Republican sure. governors, as a solution to a budgetary crisis that was in some way instigated by public sector workers. Right. Respond. First of all, the crisis was not created by the workers. It was created by legislators who, in fact, cut taxes to the very rich. And so what you had, have here is a revenue problem. You don't have a, an expense problem. But what's happened over time is by, that by cutting these taxes to the rich, you have further concentrated wealth and given them the power to finance elections and get more people that, that, that will do their bidding into office. Now, when, when the Triangle Fire happened and post that era, we came to the progressive government movement that talked about having government be responsive to the people. We now have a government that's responsive to corporations, not to people. And what, and what uh, this, this attack has been has, is, has been one that offers uh, really uh, what amounts to a dystopia. We're, we're going to be in a situation uh, soon, this very sinister kind of uh, 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 governmental operation that, that's going to be no, nothing but oppress people. Okay, now wait a second. So what, what I'm hearing here is that since the 1980s, there's been... You called it a process. Let me let me just throw out other words. There have been conscious attempts on part on the part of organized interest in the society to to uh, remove the core living standards of the middle class and working Americans for their own selfish economic ends. Is that what is that what's is that what we're saying here? Yeah, yeah, I, I think so. You know, I, I put it back to the late 70s. You know, there was a real economic crisis, a real failure of the existing system, and there was a kind of an amazing act of reinvention by the corporate and financial sector who have really profoundly restructured the world economy, financialized it at the expense of working people, and not just in the United States, all over the world. Okay, but it's not only work, it's not only them, it's you. It's the unions themselves. I, it, I, I think a fair reading of 
the history suggests that labor has missed a lot of opportunities and has not grown with and adapted to the changing Well, let's, 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 let's talk about that. Let's here. talk about that uh, honestly. I mean, what unions do well traditionally is they protect what they have. And when you get into one of these periods where all the rules get changed, you go through a process of globalization, the financialization of, of everything. Uh, you, labor unions, their first reaction to this process, and I remember I was involved in, in the 70s in the Oil, Chemical, and Atomic Workers Union, where jobs started disappearing, and people were thinking at first, well, this is somehow seasonal, this will come back in the spring. And I, having that discussion then, where it finally begins to dawn on people that these jobs are never coming back was um, a moment of frightening enlightenment for many union members and many union leaders. But that process of still trying to hold on, the truth of the matter is U.S. labor in particular thought they were still in an alliance with U.S. capital well past the end of the Cold War, when in fact, Business had no interest in having any kind of partnership with any organized entity of workers. They were reorganizing the economy, and they thought unions were in the way. And that manifested itself in, in wholesale exports of our jobs. But also, how do you take teachers and nurses and turn them into the enemy? The people who take care of your children, take care of your sick grandparents, well, how did they do it? They demonize teachers because they want to reorganize education for profit, by the way, and the unions are in the way. So, I mean, it sounds, there's, a, there's this almost this grand capitalist conspiracy to drive down the wages of workers well, and impose discipline. All, all politics is a conspiracy. Uh, this is how capitalism works. Yeah. And Ed, capital, Go ahead. capitalism unchecked, this is what they do. And it, it seeks the, the greatest amount of profit it can get. That's a process of trying to lower the wage bill constantly. And what they're willing to do, which is different right now, and what Scott Walker shows, they are willing to eliminate democratic forms that it took since Robert Wagner and Al Smith were writing the building codes that led to the New Deal and the National Labor Relations Act. They're dismantling all of those democratic institutions. But the bottom line is voters in Wisconsin voted for Scott Walker. Voters in Ohio voted for John Kasich. Voters in Indiana voted for Mitch Daniel. There's something going on out there. It may not be exactly clear, but they're not, it doesn't seem to me that they're acting without some kind of approval from an electorate. Well, look, things are not good in this country. This is a society that's not working for more and more people. We, we, we're committed to war without end. You know, we're, we're, we have a declining standard of living for most people. We have fewer securities. People look around, and frankly, the Democratic Party, and a lot of this is partisan, you know, has not offered a lot of alternatives. You know, they're very convincing. People look to the other guy, and, 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 and you're right. People elected these people to office. That doesn't necessarily mean they endorsed every policy. Right. One of the or that they were right. Right. One of the odd things we're seeing is a divergence. When you poll people on policy, they go one way. They elect people who support a different set of policies. So, so I mean, wait a second. I don't want to sound like Marx here, but there's, I mean, there sounds like an awful lot of false consciousness out there where many people don't seem to perceive their own interests. That sounds very elitist of me to, you know, phrase it. Look, like. I, I don't think that's a question of false consciousness. I think that's, you know, and you can go back, you know, Josh Legitimate points, anger? He points out, it, well, is it anger? There's uh, anger, there's anxiety. frustration, there's disorientation. Go ahead. You Absolutely. change all the rules. You, you got people that, you had entire communities that lost their whole reason for existence. A culture built on hard work. You, you get out of school, you get a job, you go to work every day, you play by the rules. That was what people were taught. They take the whole industries, they get rid of them. These communities Who's collapse. Who's they? Who's they? Capital. All right, I mean, if you will. But businesses, businesses made real decisions to offshore, to outsource work. That had the effect but the all over the system, Midwest. Bill Clinton, NAFTA allowed it. They fostered it. They so it's not only both that. parties were complicit in okay. it. Don't, don't come on. You want to talk about the politics of this? Working people have no political instrument they can depend on. Going back including to Jimmy Carter labor? and Josh pointed out, yes, including labor, in the sense that unions are not political parties. So the answer, one answer might be that labor forms some kind of political party 
perhaps along a European model that talks to the class interest of laborers? Who are their other allies? Well, I mean, well, what, I, what does I, this I look like? I think the European model's gotten weaker over the yeah, years. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Because, you know, the and idea of an and, old... And calling it the European model right. would be a mistake selling right. it. But, there, but oh, there, there, is, there is something to that. When you, when you look at post-World post War II Europe, what, what did the U.S. do in, ter in terms of Western Germany? They instituted a program that wouldn't allow fascism to raise its head again. And so they created tripartite organizations that ran various industries. Mm -hmm. They included labor, included government, and included management. And what that allowed for is, is didn't al allow this great wage disparity, the income disparity that we see in this country. Right, but that's again, and, it's happened already here. How right, do you right. address right. it? The same period that we talk, but with the same period you talk about in, in the fifth, the, from the 1970s on, 15 million people are encouraged to come into this country without full legal status as workers. Now, if this was a couple of uh, 15,000 or so, you could say it was a small problem. This was public policy. Employers wanted cheaper labor. They allowed workers to come into this country with no protections. And that had the effect of creating a huge mass pool of unorganized cheap labor, Wait which a second, also this contributes sounds like to this. the proletariat. Well, and it, the, it, the it, dynamics of the creation of the proletariat. It sounds like the triangle workers. Right. You know, uh, yeah. young, Everything old is new again. Yeah, the young, easily exploitable immigrant, immigrant. workers, you know, who uh, are not well connected to alternate sources of power who become the source of a way of life. Okay. You know, that's the ugly little secret okay, so on what which it, our life rests. What is the base, then, of a movement that would include labor and these other stakeholder interests, if you will? Well, what does this look in like? In fact, these other stakeholders are organizing. Go ahead. They create worker centers, community-based organizations that have been trying to use legal strategies, direct action, community organizing, in order to try to elevate... On the standards. ground stuff. There's a new economy. They're working out new types of organizations. You have groups like the domestic workers who were left out of the National Labor Relations mm -hmm. Act and all the state laws. Mm -hmm. Finally, last year, they, they fight and get, with very little resources, get a law to give them a minimum of protection and recognition in New York State. You have a, a group like in New York City, a, a fantastic group called the Freelancers Union, which has 90,000 members in this city. They organize workers who have skills and education that they sell. These are skilled people who are offered work, but not jobs. Okay. And they're creating new forms of organization. We're in that period. Capital completely reorganizes the economy. Everybody has to adjust, including the traditional unions. And that means what, as a labor leader or as a former and potentially a future labor leader? What does that tell you? Well, the first thing it is you have to educate the rank and file as to what's going on. They don't, they haven't gotten Poor it. communication by the unions to their own membership. Well, no, it's part I think, of it. I think that's part of it, but, but our members live in a culture that's being bombarded by, by these, uh, this false image of what's really going on. And we don't have a media outlet that allows us to express what is really happening to people, the financialization that's going on. You know, what, 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 what drove unions out of, the, out of the industrial sector was mergers and acquisitions, was the demand for, uh, from shareholders that there be greater and greater profits, and even when a company was profit and, 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 and the workers had made concessions. It was only an 8% return on investment when I can get 15% someplace else. Okay. And so what wound up happening is instead of what had been in the past, a standard being set by, by, by the industrial unions that everyone should get a pension, that everyone should get health benefits, everyone is entitled to a, to a dental plan and an eyeglass plan and the rest of it, that became the norm. Now the norm is what, 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 it, what it talks about. Someone trying to get by on 10 bucks an hour looking for a job. Now that makes the public sector workers who have pensions, who have benefits, who have a decent wage, a, li a living wage, makes them a target when you, start, when you start looking at who has to be eliminated next so we can drive down wages further. Okay, but also it's, it, it, the, the political class, if you will, looks at the budget deficits and says pensions are a problem. They the are, revenue well, wait, is wait, a problem. Okay, wait. I understand that. I mean, we're looking on one side of the ledger that, mm -hmm. that pensions are a problem. They're an increasing piece of the state budget, mm -hmm. driving out other types of programs that might be funded. There are clearly, there are clearly problems with certain of the public pensions and how they've been used and how labor is negotiated in the state legislature. Uh, problem for who? 
No, not a problem for people that have a decent pension. What is a pension? A pension is your deferred wages right. set aside so at the end of a working life, you can have a decent life. What the political class is saying is say, we've managed to, to wrangle decent pensions away from all of these private sector workers. We have their wages down close to where we want them. You're next. You can't have what we took away from them. That's the discussion. Oh, and, you know, you know, I, I, I think, oh. I think, you know, boy, I'm a foil for you. Yeah. I've fallen. The media, are you accusing me of falling into the trap? No, but you are in the media. You are among the guilty. <laughs> oh, thank you, Josh. I'm sorry. No, I was just gonna say, you know, uh, you know, yeah, in a very, very narrow sense, of course, there, there, there are real budget issues every place. I have all pensions. I don't think are the big part of it. But that's not what we see going on. Look at Wisconsin. You know, when the, the unions made the concession on yeah. pensions, they made the concession on health care. Some of this is pure ideology. Sure. You know, what look, some look, of it? Look at I would Maine. Argue most of it. Yeah, look at Maine. Maine. Last night, oh. the governor of Maine removed a mural from the Department of Labor that had pictures of Maine workers because he thought it wasn't neutral. He renamed a conference room that had been named for Frances Perkins, who had been involved in investigating the Triangle Fire, first female cabinet member of the United States, Secretary of Labor, comes from a Maine family. He, he renamed it. He thought it was too partisan. You know, this is not balancing the main budget. This has absolutely nothing to this do with the This is ideological. Budget. This is uh, political. It's so you, we're, talk, we're talking more here. And I mean, Ed, you're, I mean, you're almost phrasing it, and you too, Arthur, and, and, and you, Josh, you're talking about a critical turning point in American economic and political history, and this class war, and it's these capitalists who are declaring war on the rest of us and winning, and we're, we're being fooled by the battle. What, the, what they've decided to do is they want to reorganize the economy the way they want it. If you're a casualty of that process, they're indifferent to the impacts of what they actually do to people. Off this point where he keeps talking about this, that this is not about the money. They, there's plenty of money. It's shifting all in one direction away from working people and, and to fewer and fewer individuals and corporations. What you and, talked and, about... And what builds the animosity... Go ahead. ...that the average worker has against the public worker is that the tax burden has been shifted from the very rich to the middle class. And when they're burdened with these taxes, they say, hey, wait a minute. My kid can't get a job. It doesn't pay more than 10 bucks an hour. He doesn't get a pension. He doesn't get benefits. Why, why are the people I, I pay taxes to provide their, 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 their benefits and, 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 and their wages, why are they getting this? Rather than look at, my kid should have this as well, we need to get my kid organized. Yeah, but that's the it. classic strategy of politics, redefine the line of cleavage so you, you get the you, And when, and when you control the media, you just have to exclude certain thinking, and then you can do what you want. Oh. And, and, and the control of the media is very clear in our, in our nation today. Very few outlets exist that allow for working people and, and, a, and a world view that is from a working person's perspective to exist. Well, this is, this is part of uh, the counter-conventional wisdom then, I guess. What about impacts on politics, electoral politics, 2012 politics? Is, does no. this backfire? Is it dead man walker? Ha, have they overstepped the, the aggressive Republican well, governor, the that, main governor? That, that, remains, the that remains to be seen. How do you affect it? How do you do it? Well, you're going to have to organize at the base against him. Now, look, in Wisconsin, which is the focus of this discussion, so we'll talk about that, you know, there's going to be an attempt to take this into the political arena and see if you can take the measure of Walker. They're going to try to initiate certain recall petitions against Republican senators in order to erode their majority in their legislative right. body. And then, you know, going forward a year from now, and a year in politics is a long time, a lot of things can change. You know, there are people out there who are talking about doing a recall petition on Scott Walker. But let's talk about the politics for a minute. Go. In 2010, a broad coalition elects Barack Obama, takes both houses 2008. of the 2008, sorry. Go ahead. And then in 2010, we lose it. Part of what you're seeing played out in Wisconsin is an aggressive political strategy to guarantee that we can't get back to the strength that we had in 2008. This is in terms motiv of fundraising, motivated by a combination of politics and an ideologically aggressive, class-conscious, mean-spirited Republican Party. Ooh. And look, remember also, you know, the, the, these unions are big funders of the Democratic Party. Uh, in a place like New York State, as well as many other states, the unions are major supporters. And some of this is a defunding strategy, you know, where Republicans are trying to weaken these unions 
uh, or in some states actually to make uh, prohibitions on their political activity mm -hmm. uh, for, you know, f frankly, fairly narrow partisan reasons. They just want to uh, weaken the Democratic Party. But it's not only it's not only Republicans; it's Democrats as well. I mean, Andrew Cuomo, though not as strident and and not attacking unions, but rather some of what he's claimed were the excesses of unions. There's still the unions were a look, target, if look, you. Will. I could disagree with the governor, uh, Go Governor Cuomo, on, on the particulars of the budget. Go but on. what he is not willing to do. He is not willing to dismantle right. institutions right. of democracy in order to effectuate right. a political agenda. Yep. And it, there's a big difference between a Scott Walker and a Cuomo. Oh, and, sure. And, and from a political point of view, those who are trying to fight back in this moment, we're going to have to see the difference. There are elements within the Republican Party, less so in the Democratic Party nationally, that are willing to throw democracy out the window in order to effectuate an economy the way they want it organized. And Unions are, in fact, one of the institutions of democracy, as are public schools. And they seem to find both unacceptable. And, and it goes, one of the things about, about Wisconsin, it's very important, is what will the Democrats do in terms of offering an alternative agenda that addresses the needs of working people? Okay. Because that is going to be a hallmark for how we go forward. Next because, week. Because if the Democrats come in with more of this, yeah, we'll be buddies with the bosses, rather than we'll say, no, we're for workers. And here's what we believe, because we believe in a, demo in, in a democracy, and democracy requires that you have organized workers to be a counterbalance to organized money. Okay, so next, w next week, next show, let's talk about the agenda and how you folks might effectuate that agenda. We'll also look at the, the situation in New York City and New York State. We tended to focus on Wisconsin. So, folks, join the four of us next week to continue this conversation on labor, labor unions, and the future of the American dream. Hello, I'm Doug Musio. Let us know what you think about this show. You can reach us at cuny.tv. When you get there, click on the bar that says contact us and send your email. Whatever it is, thanks, no thanks, obnoxious, do it. Send it.